My name is Megan Clemen. Uh, I am one of the heads of the Filecoin Foundation. Things that I'm guessing everyone in this room is already on board with, like can we really trust a lot of the data that we're seeing in, you know, in papers and in journals today, right? Uh, we, in order to progress as a society, like these lofty goals of moving forward, we really need to be able to trust in institutions, in journals, uh, and unfortunately, we're having a replication crisis. Everybody knows this, right? Um, or I'm assuming that everybody in this room is already like on board with the fact that uh, there's truly staggering amounts of, um, uh, you know, of experimentation that cannot be replicated, um, and that the classic ways that we have of doing our science, sharing our science, and building on top of that science are just not cutting it in our current modern world. Uh, a report in Nature um, in 2016 shows that 70% of researchers tried and failed to re reproduce another scientist experiment. Uh, 2023 report suggests that 28% of all biomedical papers uh, published in the field are either made up or completely plagiarized. Uh, and in 2012, Amgen, um, you know, one of the world's largest biotech companies, a company that I've worked with, uh, failed in an effort to reproduce results from 53 landmark cancer research papers, um, showing only six results, meaning 90% were not reproducible. And these are cancer papers that were directly involved in therapies that were going to market. So this is, these are things that are affecting uh, the real humans that we love who are diagnosed with real world illnesses. We've had this replication crisis for decades, um, I think partially because of bad incentive structures. Um, we don't really have the incentive structures to embrace, uh, em embrace things that are becoming uh, replicatable. Everyone's looking for something novel, that's the way that you guys have been published. Um, we also don't have a robust technology stack that really enables sharing knowledge for easy reproducibility. Um, the journal system that we've you know, used that has a lot of prestige around it, um, where we share how we do an experiment, doesn't, isn't cutting it anymore for giving faith that that is actually an experiment that is going to be able to be reproduced because we're just not seeing that. Um, I think that Filecoin can be a real solution for how we can share large amounts of direct data um, and actually use technology that exists today to move past a replication crisis uh, and move into like the, the DSI world that I think a lot of us talk about a lot. Um, we have like statistics that say researchers spend 80% of their time uh, working on you know, how they're doing data processing um, and only 20% of their time figuring out how to actually use that data to come up with new experiments and move forward innovation. Um, just some examples of like the ways that the amount of data that we've been producing as a society and as a scientific community have been drastically increasing in the last handful of years. Uh, the James Webb Telescope uh, produced 100 terabytes of data in the first three years um, of existing. We've got 40 billion gigs of genomic data generated every year. That's both through commercial companies and through scientific data sets. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my background, right? So I got into Filecoin as a biologist. Uh, in 2011, I had started a company called 3Scan that did, um, we started off with doing a lot of work around whole brain emulation. We created a type of microscopy called automated serial sectioning to make pathology and histology data a little bit more like radiology data. Uh, so basically like high precision robots that would like slice through large data sets and give you stacks of images. Uh, and these were great. And these had a real ability to both give you new insights into how uh, different types of drug discovery worked and create a bridge between the different scales of biology, create a bridge between how we think about tissue scale biology with histology and pathology. Um, being able to bring that up to something more similar to radiology where you're looking at whole organ function. But the major blocker that we hit uh, was the data sets that we created. So every individual sample that we would run was about a terabyte of data. Um, even while we were just scaling up, we very quickly created 17 petabytes of data 
uh, that cost around 150k a month to store through Amazon, and it was just an intractable problem. Like when I got into you know my idealistic startup where it's like we are going to solve all of these problems in biology, and and you know maybe we're going to make real progress on imaging a brain to the scale where we can digitize it and run it into a computer. I thought that the problems that we were going to have were going to be around, you know, uh, around our imaging techniques, around machine learning, around high precision robotics. I did not think the problems we were going to have was going to be around data management. I foolishly believed that this was a solved problem. You know, like I, I used my little Google Docs. I like put something up on the cloud. Like <laughs> I did not realize the giant problems that working with something with large-scale data was going to create. And I realized more and more that that is the world that we are going into and that the, you know, that the sci-fi vision that I had as a child was going to get stopped not by, you know, like real problems, but by these very things that felt very mundane infrastructure problems. Um, so you know, my I ran my startup for many years. It got acquired. Um, but, you know, went through went through the, your classic startup story. We had like a, a messy but maybe great but maybe horrible acquisition. Um, and when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, um, this problem of you know how do we handle large data sets just loomed very heavy in my mind because it was so apparent how much. It really was the underlying infrastructure that affected everything else that we did. Uh, this is how I got into Filecoin. I'd heard about Filecoin kind of while I was working on 3Scan. Um, and you know, when I was, I was trying to figure out what to do next, the protocol labs, who are the creators of this open source protocol uh, that, you know, that is the Filecoin network, were looking to spin up the, you know, the Filecoin Foundation. And so I, I got interested in this and worked with them uh, to, to bring up the foundation. So the foundation is kind of like in the same spirit as other open source software foundations. So in the same spirit as the Apache Foundation or the Linux Foundation or the Ethereum Foundation or the Flow Foundation. Um, and uh, our mission is to you know, preserve humanity's most important knowledge. And my real like bent in this is to have a structure where we can bring in large scientific data sets, that we can create this public infrastructure that is open source, that can be built on top of, that pulls this data out of the walled gardens that we are in right now, of, you know, of Google Cloud, of, um, of Azul, of AWS, of Tencent, of Alibaba, that's like 94% of all of the world's information stored by those five companies, to pull it out of those walled gardens and to create the data repositories that the whole scientific community can build on top of. Filecoin is an option for doing this right now. So I think that we're talking about a lot of like long-term future things at this conference that are really amazing. But Filecoin is a system that you can use to upload your data right now. It's not as smooth and it's not as easy as AWS, but that is why we need to implore the scientific community to come in and start using these open source options, and I would say especially Filecoin, um, right now so that we can build these out, start making them the default and making them better. So uh, some advantages of, uh, for scientific community to use Filecoin. Um, Filecoin is inherently content addressable. So when you put your data onto the Filecoin network, uh, you get a unique content hash for that data. That means that you know anytime the data's been altered or changed. Uh, it means that if you know you want to look at somebody else's raw data from an experiment and rerun your own analysis on it, uh, you can go through um, your analysis steps and you can see that the data that you were taking from them was the same base data, and you can see that your analysis has either you know different, the same, but you know what data is the same and what data is not. I think especially for 
uh, you know, as we are using more and more things like machine learning uh, in our data sets, you always do some sort of cleaning step. You always do some kind of, you know, data preparation. And so you can still save the time being able to use other people's data preparation steps. Uh, but using that unique content hash to know that the data that's going in is the same, even if you're getting different outcomes. Uh, the cryptographic proof of storage mechanisms uh, means that the data is stored securely, um, and it means that you can you know, trust the results that you're seeing. And competitive marketplaces mean that storing large amounts of data can be much more affordable than doing it through you know, large data centers, um, you know, like, like the 150K a month that I used to spend on AWS. <laughs> Uh, we currently work with DSI Labs, who I'm sure you know most people here know, um, and uh, so we have a lot of like tie-ins already for how you can use DSI Labs to put your data onto the Filecoin network. Uh, teams like DSI Labs are using both Filecoin and IPFS um, on specific DSI nodes uh, as an interface to let scientists create. Uh, digital research objects that have the manuscripts, data sets, the code that you've used to interpret that data, presentations about the data, videos, and any other relevant research artifacts. So there's a system already set up where you can use DSI nodes for this. Um, the DSI nodes interface is developed with an open protocol, uh, letting you use decentralized persistent identifiers. So using IPFS generated CIDs, to protect the, from content drift and prevent link rot. Uh, if you're trying to look at an experiment that was done many years ago, because these are permanent links, you're still gonna be able to get that same data, get that same data set, not get a 404 error code. Uh, the Filecoin network can act as the archival layer of the decentralized persistent identifiers protocol. And Filecoin Foundation's case study uh, that we did with DSI Labs uh, is available on our website, and we'd love for everybody to read it to get sort of like a, um, you know, a, a template for one of the ways that you can use Filecoin in order to, to store your data uh, and distribute it, your data. So this is just one example of an incredible team using decentralized technologies for open science. Uh, we have a bunch of institutions that have partnered with Filecoin and Filecoin Foundation and entrusted us with their data. Um, and which is why I would really implore everyone here today to consider putting your data onto the Filecoin network and also pass it around. You're talking to somebody who sounds like they've got an interesting project, well, let them know. There's some really great data storage options around. Um, so I'm gonna dive into a couple examples of other people who are using Filecoin right now but I'm just gonna be very explicit about my overall goal, which is to get everybody here to <laughs> afterwards come up to me, think about how you wanna use Filecoin for your, your current data. So now I'm gonna sell you on it with all of our amazing partners who are current users in Filecoin. Uh, so we've partnered with a team called Generate that has over 100 terabytes of genomic research data on the Filecoin network. Um, they're enabling scientists and researchers to upload their own genomic files in a way that they can retrieve, analyze, and put into action. Um, we're working with Victor Chang at the Cardiac Research Institute. We've got over 125 terabytes of cardiac research data already on Filecoin including raw data sets from published papers, um, thousands of images of cells, and encrypted backups of their synchro patch machine. Um, I think the other thing I'd love for you to take away from this like, list of examples that I'm gonna go through is if there's data sets that are similar to any data sets that you guys are already using, it's a good opportunity to build analysis tooling that works in a decentralized fashion on top of data sets that already exist. Uh, and most of these data sets are open uh, and so any researchers who are looking for raw data to do analysis on, most of these are things that you're gonna be able to access. Uh, just come up to me and ask. Uh, we're working with CERN. We're really excited about this. Um, the data from the Atlas experiment at CERN, which is over 10 pepibytes, cloud-based storage, um, 
one of the largest particle physics research facilities in the world. Um, so, and putting all the, the, the ATLAS experiment from the Large Hadron Collider onto the Filecoin network for analysis. University of Maryland, uh, their easier data initiative is trying to make geospatial data um, much more accessible and um, change the way that we do computation in geospatial data. In 2023, the Easier Data Initiative launched the Web3 Geospatial Data Dashboard, which lets users click on Landsat scenes and see Filecoin and IPFS metadata, including uh, the active storage deals, like where, uh, where this data is being used and how, how and where it's pinned in the IPFS network. Uh, the Easier Data Initiative also launched the world's first decentralized geospatial web working group, uh, which is a community working group of individuals who are passionate about decentralized applications for geospatial data. So if anyone in the room either works with geospatial data or is interested in working with geospatial data, this is a great group to get involved with um, to be able to create the tooling for geospatial data to be used on a decentralized platform. We work with SETI. Um, SETI, for anybody who is younger than me and did not grow up uh, putting SETI at home on your giant desktop, um, <laughs> is um, a nonprofit research organization looking for extraterrestrial life. Uh, the SETI Institute uses Filecoin to safeguard their data and is storing around 60 gigs right now of decoded extraterrestrial data transmission. We really think that using the decentralized web can restore faith in science. And I think that this is not a group that I have to do a lot to convince you of that. I think that this is a group of believers in that. Um, but the thing I would like to convince you is that this is not something that you have to wait until the future to do. That by taking the extra effort to try to do this on decentralized platforms now, even if it's as a backup, even if it's as like a secondary, that you're paving the way to make decentralized file storage and a truly workable decentralized infrastructure network, something that we all can use as a scientific community in the future. That's it.